All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining uh, this morning's uh, webinar, uh, the second of our um, series, Your Passport uh, to Passive. Um, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Morningstar Investment Management um, lead this particular discussion today. Um, I'll introduce them in a second. Just to introduce myself, first, first of all, so my name is Gareth Stobie. I head up the um, Core Shares uh, business and have done so since uh, inception. I'll be um, simply chairing today's chat and I look forward to, to Vicky's presentation. Um, CoreShares has had a long-standing relationship with uh, Morningstar uh, Investment Management. Um, today they are an important client in uh, one of our biggest strategies, the Top 50 uh, Index Fund. Uh, but prior to them becoming an investor, uh, we were uh, keen followers of their uh, global research. Um, some of you may know that the Morningstar Global Business is a very established business based in Chicago, over 230 billion uh, assets under management. Um, they've got a very strong uh, research capability. Uh, some of you might know sort of key pieces of research that have garnered a lot of um, discussion over the last decade. For instance, they work around gamma which is the value of uh, financial advice. I know Vicky's going to touch on that. But we keen followers of work that they've done on costs whilst investing, some of their recent work on, on ESG or their ongoing work in the field of ESG. And Morningstar themselves are actually a provider of uh, indices to, um, to global product houses. So they've got a very deep, rich um, set of um, uh, research capabilities that we as a firm have leveraged and I would encourage advisors to leverage as well, particularly when it comes to some of the behavioral aspects of providing financial advice and kind of the contemporary way um, of thinking of uh, financial advice. So as a global firm, uh, um, great reputation. Um, and at a local level, uh, Vicky has been working very hard. Victoria Rivas, who's our guest from uh, Morningstar, has been working really hard uh, over the last six or seven years as Morningstar has built out their business uh, in South Africa to provide, um, you know, an excellent consulting service to advisors who are looking to, to construct uh, uh, portfolios. To, to introduce Vicky more formally, so Victoria Rivers uh, is the Managing Director for the Morningstar South Africa Investment Management Group, and she's also a Senior Portfolio Manager. She is responsible for leading the business and leveraging Morningstar's global investment capabilities to provide best practice investment management for clients. Her career at Morningstar began with the formation of the South African investment management business in February 2015. Um, and she, she's responsible for, for leading the investment team, uh, building portfolios to better deliver uh, investment outcomes for clients. Prior to that, um, Victoria was the founder and CEO of Trivium Capital, an investment consulting and research firm. Um, whilst at Trivium, she drove strategy. She was also a senior portfolio manager there. And prior to Trivium, uh, many of you might have come across uh, uh, Vicky in a number of um, capacities, uh, both at Investec uh, Bank and at Investec uh, uh, Asset Management. Um, Victoria has 20 years experience in financial services um, and she holds a bachelor's degree in finance from the University of Cape Town. So um, without further ado, Vicky, I think I'll, I'll hand over to you. Um, there, there are some housekeeping issues which I'm going to come to right at the end of the presentation around Please ensuring that you enter your ID number so that you get, can get the valuable CPD points. And then I'll also touch on the next webinar uh, in, in the series. Thanks, Becky. Over to you. Thank you, Gareth. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you today, albeit virtually. And I do hope that soon we can return to our normal in-person life. However, it is a pleasure to be part of this series. And I was delighted when Gareth and the Core Shares team asked us to be uh, to participate in this Passport to Passive series. I think it's incredibly important uh, to understand the role of passive in portfolio construction. And I know this is the second of the three-part series, and I would encourage all of you to dial in for the third one, because it's going to be very interesting when um, Deborah Slava actually talks to a number of advisors around uh, the use of passive and, and looking at the advancement of the modern financial advisor. So. I am going to give you uh, some background today at how Morning, at Morningstar, how we look at using passive in portfolio construction. But before I get to the actual portfolio construction side of the presentation, I just wanna 
give you some background into the way in which we actually think about passive. So from a Morningstar perspective, there are really three things that uh, you look at when you want to use passive and, and three overriding principles. The first is cost. You want to get a reduced cost at a portfolio level. The second is diversification. The third is predictability. The reducing the risk of underperformance. And I'm going to address that in quite a bit of detail. And then I want to take all three of those views and look at how we package those together when building portfolios. Now, I'd like to start by just debunking a common view, which is that active and passive managers are mutually exclusive. So you as an advisor, as an investor need to pick, should I put all my money in a passive fund or should I put all my money in an active manager? And this is an ongoing debate, active versus, versus passive. And from a Morningstar perspective, we don't think that that makes sense at all. We think that the view should really be one of use active where it makes sense and use passive where it makes sense. It sounds very simple and I appreciate that it's not as straightforward as that. And there are many things to look for in picking a, an active manager, but also in picking your passive manager. But what is important to understand is in all the work we do, what are we really trying to achieve? We're trying to generate excellent investment returns for investors. Now the starting point is beta. The starting point is your market. And if you scroll to the left and you look at active managers, the alpha that managers are trying to generate, in reality, over prolonged periods of time, good active managers generate about one to 2% of alpha, i.e. returns above the market over time. Now that is net of fees. And if you compound that, that's a good return. But that is really the goal of active managers is to generate a return alpha above that of beta, the market. Now, if you look at the full value chain, Gareth mentioned some of the work done by Morningstar spoke about gamma and that, that Greek letter on the far right is, is, is Greek for gamma. And gamma was work done by a, one of our behavioral scientists, David Blanchett, who looked at the value of financial advice. And he the work that David did uh, showed that on average, the value that is added by good financial advice equates to two to 3% per annum after fees. So if you look at this value chain, you can actually see that the greatest value that is added in the entire value chain comes from the value of, of advice. And why do I say that? Well, the markets can go up 50% and you could have bought a good passive fund. There might be an active manager out there that delivers a return of 50% for the year. But if you as the advisor can't keep your investor invested, then that is a paper portfolio return. Nobody actually generated that return and no investor gets the pleasure of that return. So the hardest part is actually keeping your investors invested during the cycle, because we know that markets definitely don't move in straight lines. The allure of great alpha or cheap markets and upside from beta is very tempting, but actually as investors, our own behavioral biases do tend to get the better of us. And most investors actually struggle to sit through that cycle. So in, when I talk about one of the benefits of using passive today, it's in, in it helps you as advisors, or should I say it helps your investors actually stay invested because it does smooth sometimes the lumpiness of the alpha cycle and pro provides lower costs and some better predictability of performance. So I'm just gonna to touch on the first three factors, well, the first of the three factors, which is cost. Now, if we look at the South African ASISA categories, what this chart will show you is the range of fees per category. So if we look at the high equity category, you can see that there are some funds, the blue bar is the range, there are some funds that you can buy that charge fees of around 50 basis points, 30 to 50 basis points, all in. And you can see at the top end, there are some high equity funds that have a charge a fee of close to 4% per annum, all in. But the average is the yellow dot. Now, averages, uh, there's really, they're about, you know, if you look at the multi asset category, it's like two to 300 funds per category. In the general equity sector, there are, you know, over 350 funds. But if you just look at this, you can see A, there's a very wide range of returns per category, some quite low down, those are your passive funds, some at the top end. Some, someone's very cheeky in the multi asset, high flexible category to charge an annual TIC of close to 7%. But needless to say, the average TIC per category 
is over 1%. And in the multi-asset categories, the balanced fund categories, it ranges from 1.6% to 1.79 all in. Different asset classes, you can see income is slightly cheaper than equity, but I want you to just bear this in mind as I go through the rest of the presentation. And I'm gonna focus my portfolio construction conversation around the multi-asset category. But keep in mind the number of 1.6 to kind of 1.79% per annum as an average TIC for a balanced fund. In essence, what you're saying if you're paying 1.79% is that you're paying 1.79 for their equity, for the income, for the property, for the global, and for the asset allocation expertise that comes with that. So when we look at those fees, those are pretty high. We know that passive, you can get much cheaper, but obviously price isn't everything. But I just wanted to frame this as a background to portfolio construction to say, keep the 1.79 in, in your mind. The next is predictability. Now, if we look back at 2020, a very busy visual, but what I wanted you to get from this visual is that while the market, the all share index, which is what most investors, most man on the street, most end investors will reference, what did the all share index do? <clears throat> Excuse me. The all share index did 7% in 2020, but actually only 29% of shares were positive for the year. 63% of shares lost, lost, lost money. And I've shown you here that the SWIX did 2.6%. If we look at active managers in the ASISA equity, general equity category, only 23% of them beat the market. So 7% is a good return. Well, it's a real return. It's good compared to the last uh, seven years we've had from equity returns in SA, but the average equity funded 2%. Now make no mistake, there are some fantastic active equity managers that generated solid double digit returns to investors. And this is in no way a dig at active managers. There were 36% of the funds in the category that ended the year in negative territory. The point of this slide is to say that picking the right active manager at the right point in the cycle is a challenge and 2020 really proved that. But if you look back over time, what I wanted to highlight in this slide is the number of active managers that have outperformed the market over the last one year, three year, five, seven and 10 years. And you can see that the number in red is pretty low. So to beat the market's a hard gig, it's pretty tough to actually generate returns in excess of the market. What this slide doesn't show you is that the managers who have generated excess returns have, gen have often generated very healthy excess returns. So looking at this is just to show you, to highlight again the point of that picking the right active manager is a challenge and that beating the market is very tough. We definitely have nuances in South Africa, the NUSPAS effect that has skewed the ability for managers to outperform the index, but it's not just a South African phenomenon. If we look at global funds, you can see over the last one, three and five years in the global equity category, the number of funds outperforming global, the, the MSCI ACQUI is also between 16% of managers to 34. It is a similar story globally to what we've seen domestically, that momentum has been very much in favor, large cap has been in favor, and it's been very tough for active managers to outperform the market. But I think if we look at these numbers over a 10 year period, the fact that 13% of managers over that period have outperformed the market shows just quite how tough it is. And then lastly, an important reason for using passive is diversification. And our market struggles with that. We have, uh, this is a, share, a slide done by, by Kahiso. I find it quite a powerful slide. In South Africa, if we cast our mind back over the last 10 to 15 years, we've had a couple of strange things happen almost without it being too obvious to the naked eye. The, the first is we're very aware of the economic demise that we've seen in our country. And that hasn't been evidenced in our market returns because of the dominance of a lot of large cap dual listed shares. But where it has been evidenced is if you look at the, the decline or the, ch the change of the top 40 composition and the shrinkage that we've seen in the investable universe for managers. So a number of the South African focused businesses have really fallen out of the top 40. They've fallen into the mid cap space and some of them even into the small cap space. At the same time, you've seen a very large dominance in terms of asset gathering from some of the larger managers. 
And what this slide shows you is that if you are a, an asset, a large asset manager and you have an equity mandate of more than 200 billion, and you don't want to be more than 10% of the free float of a share, and you don't actually ever want to be more than 10% of the free float of the share, it just means you're pretty much holding it for a very long time. There are only 17 shares that you can buy. So it, it highlights the shrinking universe of opportunity for larger managers. And when you do look at a lot of these shares, a lot of them are big dual listed companies. So we've seen ourselves as South African investors faced with a declining investment universe and a dominance of really the large cap heavy shares. But what is interesting is understanding when it comes to diversification that not all passive is created equally. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you look at last year, the All Share Index delivered a return of 7%. The SWIX delivered a return of 2.6. And the CAP SWIX delivered a, point, a return of 0.6. And that's because last year, NASPAS gained 32% and resources were up 21. Pretty much, if you didn't own resources in NASPAS, it was hard to generate solid positive returns. Cast your mind back to that earlier slide I showed you with the fact that most of the market, 63% of the market was actually negative. So why am I showing you this? Well, it's because investors often think when I buy a passive fund, I'm getting the all share. But actually, I would say 99% of active equity managers benchmark themselves against the SWIX. And the SWIX, when it comes to, say, performance fees, is at times an easier hurdle to beat. But it's got a very different composition. And then there are also managers who say, well, the SWIX has got 20% in NASPAS, so I need to benchmark myself against the CAP SWIX. And you can see that that does change your return hurdle if you're an active manager, and also your return outcome if you're a, an investor buying a passive fund. So you need to know what passive fund you're buying, and you need to know why you're buying it. And these are really the four indices, and I've just highlighted the top five counters. The top five shares of the All Share Index equate for 51% of the mark of, of, the, of, the, of your investment. That's not broad diversification, in, in my opinion. It's quite concentrated, in fact. If you looked at the capped, SWIC, uh, capped All Share, it accounts for 44. It's much better. If you look at SWIX, you can see that although your top five counters account for 40%, NASPAS is 25% of the capped SWIX. That, the, that is maybe a good investment at certain times, but it is in no way a diversified investment. And then you can see the impact of the cap SWIX. So from a Morningstar perspective, Gareth mentioned we have um, been working with core shares since the inception really of Morningstar. And, and the reason for that was we did a lot of work on when you buy passive, what do you want? You want diversification, you want low cost, and you want predictability. And we looked at all the different indices available to us. And, and the top 50 really stood out as a preferred choice, head and shoulders for a number of reasons. And the first reason is that we like the fact that NASPASS was capped. So you can just show, I've just shown the rating versus Satrix top 40 here, the cap NASPASS. The second, and I think this is something often overlooked, but make no mistake, the importance of it is that you get 50, not 40. So in a large cap dominated environment in a shrinking universe in South Africa, an extra 10 on 40 gives you an almost 20% greater diversification. And you're getting access to the next 10 of the mid cap space which right now is actually where we're seeing a lot of value. The other importance is that prior to obviously resources run, which we've seen over the last year, is that the all share index as, a, as, a, as an index versus SWIX had much more Anglos, Billiton and Richmond. So you had greater diversification at a resources perspective. But I do think in South Africa, and particularly I'm using the, the top 50 here, it, it is the passive fund of our choice that you do get diversification. And a lot of that does come through, as I say, the 50, not the 40. So when you look at buying, for example, a top 50 passive fund, yes, you have got exposure, healthy exposure to basic materials, and you have an exposure, healthy exposure to financial services as well as communication services. But it is broadly representative of a diversified index, particularly also because it has the cap on NASPASS. So how do we take all of that and put that together when we're building portfolios? I've mentioned cost, I've mentioned diversification, and I've mentioned predictability. So at Morningstar, we um, build portfolios from the bottom up. 
We like to build an equity core that reflects our highest asset class convictions, a global core, fixed income, and then we our asset class convictions are reflected through those different um, asset classes. We don't use balanced funds to build portfolios. It is a way that many people do build portfolios. There are pros and cons to both approach. The work we've done at Morningstar um, and the capital markets work, as well as the manager selection work, allows us to build portfolios on a granular le level. And I'm gonna give you some examples of the benefits from both a cost and a diversification perspective. So back to my original costing slide. A high equity fund, 179 on average. Some cheaper, some more expensive. The see-through asset allocation, broadly speaking, is let's say 40% in SA equities, 28% um, global equities, 27% fixed income, and let's put 5% in property. This is a broad asset allocation. I'm merely giving an example here. Things may be different, but I think you'll, you'll get the point. Now, you can build this high equity portfolio on the right using a blend of active and passive. So let's use the core shares MSCI Acqui Tracker for global. Let's use the top 50 for the local equity. Let's use an active fixed income manager, Coronation Strategic Income for the fixed income portion, and an active property manager, Sesfakile, for property. And I've just put the TICs of these underlying funds. So in theory, a very kind of concentrated at a, at a the share level, a very basic portfolio of, of four funds, you can build for 54 basis points. That's, that's pretty cheap, TIC all in. But yes, it's got a lot of, the, the equity component's 100% passive. So you're, you're looking at like 70% passive. And maybe that's not how um, people want to build portfolios. You, you want some more active. So if we look at this and we say, all right, let's build an equity core that reflects very good ac active equity managers and very good. Um, and, and then on the global side, let's bring in some good active global managers as well. Let's, let's split up the, the two passive components. And from a Morningstar perspective, I'm just using managers that, that, we, that we like and that we use. Let's bring in ALIT equity uh, as a good value manager, focus on, on quality. Let's bring in fair tree equity, uh, a good earnings momentum manager. And then on the global side, let's bring in 90 franchise, um, good quality, uh, large cap manager for global. And what you can see in this example is that you can actually build that same asset allocation for almost half the cost, or well, more than half the cost. 81 basis points, that's the TIC, that's all in. It is more expensive than a predominantly passive portfolio, but you know, as I said, we, we like to use passive where it makes sense and active where it makes sense as well. And I'm not in any way giving advice here, I'm just showing you the levers that you have at your disposal. And I think the key one to look at is that, as I mentioned, if, you, if you're paying 179 for a multi-asset fund, that's what you're paying for the income and the equity component of it. And what I can show you here is you can pay you know, for fixed income, 54 basis points for very good active fixed income. And for global, you can pay 41 basis points. You, you don't have to pay 179. Even for very good active global, you can pay 135. So yes, in this fee, there is the asset allocation fee, but the point is you don't have to pay that much to get a very well-constructed portfolio of active as well as passive managers. Now, if we look at that equity core, when I speak about predictability, this chart will show you the rolling excess returns of equity managers over the market. The black line is the all share index. The blue line is fair tree. The green line is ALIT. And you can see that, uh, and the red line is the core shares top 50 fund. So while the ETF has a much longer track record, uh, the unit trust's track record is, is uh, slightly shorter. What I wanted to highlight here is that, you know, when you, in terms of predictability, investors will benchmark to this black line, to the market. And these are returns in excess or below underperformance of the market. And, and you can see that active is definitely, you know, there are times when you feel very good about your portfolio and there are times when you're very worried if you've underperformed as an investor, it's natural. But the, but what bringing passive does is not only reduce costs, but it brings in that element of predictability. Why would a, a passive fund like CoreShares outperform or underperform the market? Um, the outperformance would come at times when perhaps resources did better and NASPASS underperformed. And this period of marginal, very marginal underperformance would be the cap on NASPASS 
uh, when this pass has actually been a big driver of returns in the market. So in bringing it back to the portfolio construction side, um, this is what, uh, these visuals are what Morningstar term an equity style box. And we like to use this when we build portfolios because we like to A, blend styles, but B, if we're looking for a good value manager, we want a manager who expresses that. And we also want to, as I mentioned in the beginning, we start with passive as our core. So we wanna know what is the core that we, we have as our equity core, and then we will build our con asset class convictions around that. So what you can see is that it's, it, it, the, the way you would interpret this graph is um, on the, the y-axis, it's moved from small cap stocks up to large cap stocks. And on the x-axis, it moves from deep value to growth shares. And every single share in the market is assigned a metric. There are 12 valuation metrics that they look at. And then market cap is obviously divided between top 40, mid cap, and small cap. So you can see that a passive manager, the core shares top 50 in this case, is it's in large cap blend. Why is it not large cap growth? That really shows you the discount that sits in the, the 40 to 50 shares that it holds that they sit much more kind of in the value side and, and really the, the, the impact of just having an extra 10 shares that so puts it in the blend. I've just shown Fairtree here, uh, really mid cap blend. They have a lot of resource shares um, in, in their funds at the moment. And then Alit sitting very much in the mid cap value, which would make sense given the style of that manager. And then we can actually drill down to see you know, where the percentage of the portfolios sit. So what is nice about this work is that um, when you look at building portfolios, I hope I've highlighted that you, you can build them pretty cheaply. You can use passive where it makes sense, A, from a cost perspective, B, from a diversification perspective, and, and C, just from a style perspective of what it is you want to hold and knowing what you hold and, and creating that predictability of I know what I have in my portfolio and I can build active positions around that but you don't have to make the decision of an either or. So in kind of wrapping up, um, I think it is important to join conversations like we're having today, to get an understanding of what passive is. Not all passive is made equally um, and know why you're investing in passive. Passive has hugely powerful components that it brings to portfolio construction, it brings to investing, and it brings to an investor's investing experience but know what passive you're buying and, and where it makes sense. We would say in multi-asset portfolios, don't overpay for cash, active cash or, or income assets where you can get them pretty cheaply. And think active and passive, not active or passive. The two are very complementary if you think of them together. The minute you think of them as mutually exclusive, you can send yourself down a rabbit hole of, 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 uh, of questions and, and worries and, and actually end up somewhere very far from where you started. So on that note, I, I'm gonna hand over to questions. Uh, there are some questions from the audience. Hope you've got some hard questions for me. Um, and, and then Gareth, uh, I'm gonna stop at sharing and, and hand over to you. Great, thanks Vicky. That was uh, very insightful. Um, we do have some questions coming through. Um, I'm just battling to navigate them, to be honest, but I'm going to help try and work it out now. Um, Vicky, a couple of questions around, um, and I'm not ex sure what exposure your, your firm has to this, so I, I can also sort of chip in, but the, the changing landscape in terms of pension funds and their, their use of um, a passive, and also in that declining um, market of liquid shares, um, uh, you know the need for, for for pension fund reform to 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 deal with that, so that um, pension funds have got a greater choice around um, you know which stocks they uh, include in the portfolios. So I mean perhaps I can I can dive in on on the pension fund side. Um, I mean we certainly at Corsia see a, a lot of increased use of passive um, at a at a pension fund level, typically not within CIS or pooled vehicles, but very much in segregated accounts that fit quite neatly within the pension fund as uh, sort of operational framework, which is not to say that pooled vehicles like unit trusts or ETFs can't be used by those funds. Very often, it actually makes a lot of sense to use them because they, they're keenly priced um, 
and very efficient to use. You can get in, get out. The reporting is all clean, well governed, and so forth. Um, so we are seeing increased use. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, consultants who advise pension funds on um, manager selection and that, well, certainly in our view, probably aren't as contemporary as the Morningstar guys. They, they, they tend to be uh, quite old school in terms of how they think about um, allocating to, to, to managers. So I think um, a lot of work to be done with uh, local consultants in the field of passive and also a lot of work to do around education with uh, trustees and principal officers and certainly this type of um, educational series that we're running just at the moment um, in part is uh, aimed uh, at, at educating not just financial advisors but, but other stakeholders um, uh, in, in, in the market. Um, Vicky, a question specific to you around um, how active you are in changing managers and switching between uh, various types of funds. Sure. So, Gareth, uh, before I answer that, I, I just want to add um, from a Morningstar perspective, uh, pension fund use of passive, you know, globally, it is massive. So if you look at the trends uh, from a global perspective and the flows into passive, it has dwarfed flows into active managers. I think at, at one stage there was a, a stat to show that, I think it was 2017, 2018, that um, you know, passive funds took more than the entire active management industry combined um, you know, globally in, in, in the states alone. So it's definitely been something that's been well adopted. And I think for those reasons that I stated, in South Africa, you're right, in the retail space, it hasn't been as well adopted um, yet. But uh, you know, the, the mind boggles to some degree because I think the argument is pretty compelling. So the question about Morningstar, uh, we spend a lot of time during our work up front to understand what we're investing in. And when I mean, we follow Morningstar's in research process when we are re reviewing managers, both active and passive. And, and Gareth, you'll be familiar with the process we went through in selecting the Corsair's top 50 fund, which was very rigorous and um, yeah, months, if not years of kind of work in terms of, of, and that was just to kind of select a passive fund. Once we have selected our, our, our managers, we, we let them we let them do what they're 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 there to do. And so so since um, running Morningstar, we haven't actually replaced any of our managers because the work was done up front, and there's been no change to our original thesis in investing with those managers. There are managers we've upweighted or downweighted based on the asset exposure and the asset class convictions we have, but no um, changes in our core equity or income managers. Okay. Um, there's a question, Vicky, around um, if you choose to invest, say, in the in the top 50 index, which um, is run by S&P, and we, we have the two funds which track it, uh, you are taking um, an active decision relative to some of the FTSE indices you were looking at earlier, so the, the SWIX, the CAP SWIX, the Aussie, for instance, and therefore it's not passive per se, you're making an active decision around that. And I, I, mean, I think that was kind of the, precisely the point you were making. Yeah, and that is, uh, you know, that's a debate that one can, can have uh, ad infinitum. The decision to, to, I would say you need to break it down. Do I want to buy a passive solution, i.e. a predictable index that I know I'm gonna track? So there are a lot of sort of smart beta passive funds and we would say that's, that's, that's an active decision. When we think passive, we're saying you're picking an index that you want to track, and you are, you have an it's predictable the holdings, the fees, and and what what will be the constituents of that underlying index. The work needs to be done to say of the indices of my choice, i.e., FTSE, that the, the, your cautious you know, top 50, a SWIX, a capped SWIX, uh, a capped Aussie, which one makes more sense to me? And we would say consider the number of holdings, i.e. diversification, the capping of NASPAS or not, and then the the, the index, is it SWIX or Aussie, i.e. does it have more Anglos Bulletin and Richmond, or is it more SWIX based, which has, has less of those holdings? But yeah, it, every decision is an active decision, right? Uh, That's <laughs> right. Big... Yeah. Um, and, and Vicky, um, globally, we've seen an absolute um, kind of flurry of uh, thematic uh, strategies come to market, some of them in actual index construct um, and others more actively managed, but within an ETF sort of wrapper. 
what, what is Morningstar's take on the world of thematic investing? Uh, would you encourage it in portfolios or, or not? And, and what's your sort of house view on that? Gareth, I'm going to bring that home to, to give context to it from a South African perspective. I think one of the, um, let's say, criticisms of passive, which is it's inherent in its construct and is something that a, a lot of market participants may capitalize on at the demise, I would say, of investors, is that there is momentum in that strategy, i.e. a defined index weight will always hold more of shares that go up. So you, you have an element of momentum. Now, one of the things that we've seen in um, South Africa of late is the launch of what we would call the fad products, whether they're fang funds or um, you know, really hot products that everybody wants to get hold of and have performed very well in the short term, but really they're capitalizing on a, a global theme that would sell in South Africa. And I, th I think strategies like that, they may have their place, but to me, it, it, it's, um, as I say, it's capitalizing on, on, on a very late cycle theme. So it's maybe not to investors' best interests. But when you look at um, the concept of passive, what it should give investors, is the ability to access broad asset classes um, in a low cost diversified way. So for example, uh, you should be able to buy a you know, global energy ETF if global energy is um, an asset class that is looking attractive at the moment, which we, we think it is, um, not because it's a fad, but because it is actually a defined sector, it's trackable, it's, 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 got, it's got legs. It's a, it's, a sec it's, a, it's a style or theme that should you know, survive through time. Uh, but, uh, but as I say, right now, we're seeing a lot of kind of indices be being created in some of the more popular areas at late cycle. Thanks. Um, question here, which perhaps I can tackle around, do, do we foresee a scenario where um, passive fees will enter the you know, sub 10 basis points as a, as a, as a fee range? Um, and like we've seen in the, in, the, in the mega big kind of passive funds, globally run by Straight Street and Vanguard and BlackRock and so forth. Um, I think, I mean, we often challenged on this to say, well, maybe the adoption in passive in South Africa is slightly lower because our fees haven't quite reached where the global fee scales are. Um, we always uh, feel quite defensive around that question because I think the reality is that globally only um, a few dozen funds have come down to that level of fee where you, where you under 10 basis points. And they tend to be very vanilla, very generic benchmarks run by the very biggest uh, companies, um, uh, asset managers, uh, that is. So yes, that's where global pricing has gone to on, on, on certain benchmarks. But as soon as you're outside of those very vanilla benchmarks, most index funds are uh, more expensive than that. And actually the pricing of... Uh, passive funds by South African providers, including ourselves, have come down um, through, through time. Um, you know, if, if you reverse sort of five years ago, if you wanted to buy a, a US tracker on, on the JSC, you, you were paying nearly a percent, and now you're paying a quarter, a quarter of a percent. Um, so it, it has come down sharply. The market is becoming more efficient here. Scale is building here, and we expect pricing to, to come down. But I, I do think, Overall, uh, clients should want to pay something for their money to be managed because at the end of the day, there's a lot of infrastructure uh, that goes into managing index funds efficiently. Um, clients should want um, a high level of governance and, and, and risk management around uh, those, those processes, which uh, the local pro providers, um, I'm sure, all, all, all do provide. And, and, and so there is a critical underpin, there is a critical cost base there that ultimately needs to be paid for on top of you know, um, you know, running um, uh, uh, businesses as well. Um, so, so I think I think we're getting there, but we shouldn't expect uh, kind of where where, where Vanguard's pricing its U.S. indices. Um, it's kind of how I want to leave that. Um, um, Gareth, sorry, can, was, I, yeah. can I just add some color to that? I because we get that question a lot as well, and it, it's very interesting because structurally South Africa has higher fees than the rest of the world. If you look at our equity funds versus global equity funds, fixed income everything is structurally higher. We also have higher cash rates. So we come off a higher, you know, we've, it's, it, it's, it's, everything's slightly better in South Africa in, in that sense, it, well from, yeah. But the point is that it's a scale game. And I don't think people, 
sometimes appreciate the costs of running um, actual running these businesses. So when you get the likes of Vanguard coming out saying they're going to do it for free, they're not doing it for free. You can only access it via their platform and you're paying a platform fee. So nothing is for free in life. And in I, I you know, you you get uh, you know what happened globally is this kind of this war of uh, you, you, do you remember that term from economics, an island of loss and a sea of profit? Uh, asset managers saying, I'm going to get market share to become competitive, but I'm going to, I'm going to run at a loss until I can gain that market share. I'm going to, the only way I'm going to survive is I'm going to eat my neighbor's lunch. And so there is this perception that, you know, and sub 10 basis points is, is the norm for passive, but it's, it's not actually the norm. And, and it's, I don't know how sustainable it is. You can't price down to zero. They're, they're absolutely fixed costs to running these strategies. And and I think as investors, you want to be with a business that A, does have the scale and B, does have the business sustainability to ensure that all the compliance that is, is done, that the training is executed correctly, that the indices are matched. So I don't think price should be the pure focal point here. So it's a relative yeah. price. Yeah. I, I, I suppose the passive providers have created their own conundrum in that regard because we're the ones who are constantly focusing on price. So I guess fair enough for, for, for clients to sort of ask when we're we matching Vanguard. Um, and that. Um, just, just a reminder to everyone who who has who continues to stay on, please do stay on and in order to get your CPD points because you're going to need to enter your ID number in that at the end of uh, the session. Uh, we're going to carry on with Q&A for a little while longer and I would encourage you to please type your questions into the, the Q&A tab um, uh, as part of the, the service. Vicky, um, a question around what percentage of your model portfolios are uh, invested in passive? Roughly 30%. So we use, um, we, we, we like your top 50 fund as a, as a core within our equity component and um, global might make sense as well, as, as well as in the fixed income side bonds, government bonds, and all be tracker if you're just looking for duration, so. Okay, great. Um, a question around, um, well, let me read it out. Um, with the move to incorporate more ESG, thematic, and sustainable investing, how would passive investments assisting? Uh, how would passive investments assist in the reporting function? I, I can have a go at that, Vicky, if you like. But um, I don't know if you've got your own views. But certainly, from 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 CoreShare's perspective, um, we're looking at ESG through um, a number of different uh, lenses. Um, I think clearly there are more and more ESG uh, indices that are available uh, in the marketplace. So we would like to be in a position to guide clients on the difference between these different ESG indices, depending on what the, the client is um, looking to achieve uh, and, and, and take them through those simple frameworks of the different indices and kind of the tension that often exists between liquidity and diversification on the one hand, and then the ESG scores of, of the different uh, component companies on the other hand, uh, we are often able to run very simple uh, index mandates which exclude particular SIN stocks or stocks that the client by their own request has asked us to please remove from um, uh, an index. So take the top 50 for instance, if a client wanted to specifically remove, I don't know, alcohol stocks or tobacco stocks from that and for us to run a mandate. Uh, that's a service that we provide. But ultimately, where we would like to get to long term as a company um, is to play a more active role in um, actually owning shares and then voting those shares and engaging with the management teams of the companies that we own. So we have adopted a, a proxy voting policy already that looks to um, uh, put best practice in place whenever we vote shares. But over the longer term, we're going to be investing more and more into uh, resource allocation that actually means that we have sort of active stewardship around the shares that, that we own. And that's been a big theme globally. I mean, the big uh, passive managers like BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street and others have said, well, they, they've ended up being the big shareholders of most global corporations. And, and so it's incumbent upon them to invest in um, exactly that act, active stewardship and how, how they're engaging with those companies um, and encouraging positive change around issues to do with the environment, um, social causes, uh, ensuring that the, the companies they invest in are well governed uh, and, and, and so forth, um, rather than just simply selling out of a share, which an active manager might be in, in, in inclined uh, to do. Uh, Vicky, I don't know if you've got anything you'd like to, to add to what I, I've just said. Hope, 
Actually, agree. Yeah, and yeah, I'd echo your thoughts, and you know, we're very encouraged by the move that um, you guys are doing with regards to the activity as as asset or as stakeholders in the businesses. I think what you've seen globally is, while many passive houses have launched um, sustainable indices, really where their the need for their active vote comes in is on their on their their straight like in their their, their non ESG indices. Their uh, you know, their S&P 500 trackers, for example. And you're definitely seeing a shift towards greater use of the proxy voting, um, more involvement and required by investors of these managers. So it's definitely um, it, it's definitely something that, that passive funds are not, are not shying away from. Um, and yeah, I'm encouraged to see it's coming to SA as well. Well done, Gareth. Great. Um, Vicky, a question around, uh, you had those slides towards the end of your presentation around how you look at styles and blending different kind of combinations of managers. Um, would you consider Morningstar style agnostic or, or um, I guess what they're trying to ask through that question is whether you aim to neutralize those styles or, or what, what exactly your goal is when, when looking through that, that grid of, of different styles, yeah. So styles are really the last component when we put a portfolio together. From a Morningstar perspective, uh, we apply a valuation-driven approach to building our portfolios. And there's very powerful research behind the asset allocation decisions that we make. So we leverage the capital markets work that our, our team does to build a fair value for every asset class and then find asset classes that are looking cheap or expensive relative to their fair value. So that will define our asset allocation. And the question around how active we were earlier is we're pretty active around our asset allocation. But then when we express that asset allocation in South Africa, it is more difficult in, in that uh, you don't have a large choice of, of passive uh, funds available to, to get very granular. So we would use our core shares top 50 as, as, our, as a core holding within that um, equity component. But then the expression of value or growth would be dependent on the sectors where we're seeing opportunities. So for example, right now we're seeing good opportunity in financials and it's a lot of SA Inc some, and some of um, select resources. And so managers like ALIT, like PSG would be managers that we actually have uh, quite a healthy exposure to to express those. So no, we don't just blend value, momentum and growth to create an equity core. Uh, we would have exposure to the areas where we seen the greatest, con uh, have the greatest conviction. And, and, and sorry, last point on that is for showing the reason also showing the style boxes is for advisors. It's quite nice to actually see that managers are doing what they say they're doing. So if if a manager tells you they're they're a you know, value manager, they're looking for opportunities in mid caps, those style boxes actually allow you to see like is that manager doing what they say they're doing. So it also just allows us to map process back to um, uh, to philosophy or investment philosophy. Okay, a question around um, other African markets, um, perhaps more from an institutional standpoint, but uh, do you guys map other African markets? Is it something you've ever looked to include within your portfolios? No, Gareth, I'm, I'm, I don't actually have an answer for that one. We, uh, we don't use our Africa allocation within our client portfolios, um, and we don't have a lot of data on Africa. And I, just one of the reasons why we don't use it in client portfolios is, uh, broadly speaking, liquidity, cost, accessibility, and transparency. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, sorry, no, no comment on Africa. Okay, great. I'm just having a look through the questions. I think we've answered most of them. A couple of repeat questions. Um, you, you answered earlier, Vicky, around the percentage allocation to passive being 30%. What, what informed that number? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, our, our default is, so, so globally, we run slightly higher allocations. Our default is actually almost 100% to passive. So if we were to benchmark ourselves, we would benchmark ourselves against what an investor could buy if they built a portfolio using passive indices. It's, it's cheap and it's, it's a good expression of what they could buy. And so in South Africa, there are very limited levers of passive that we can access. Um, in our global portfolios, we, we do run higher allocations, probably closer to 40, 45. And that's because, as I mentioned, we can buy a global energy ETF. Um, we can buy um, you know, South Korean ETF. There's, 
there's access points that you have at your disposal. So when an asset class is so cheap that no manager actually globally wants to invest in it on an active basis, passive makes you know, perfect sense. When an asset class is very expensive and overcrowded, that's actually when active makes sense globally. So we use, you know, if I look at our global portfolios, we use a lot of active managers for our US exposure and we use passive managers for some of the more unloved areas of the market. Uh, domestically, as mentioned, it's tricky. So um, you can get uh, equity, you can get bond and you can get global, but you can't really buy uh, you know, linkers or credits or um, more niche you know, financials trackers. So, so it, is, it was really by choice, but by, the, by, the, by the choice architecture that we had. Right, so I think, Vicky, we've pretty much answered the questions that have come through. One or two more on um, ESG and, you know, I suppose who, who, who's better placed between kind of active managers and passive managers. If you look up, look forward, say, three decades, um, you know, in terms of capital markets playing their role uh, in terms of that, that challenge. I don't know if you've got any other thoughts on, on the matter you'd like to share. Uh, on, on ESG active versus passive? Is yeah. that the question? Okay. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yes. So, I mean, ESG is an interesting one because globally, particularly in Europe, so obviously Trump, uh, you, you saw flows and, 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 and funds being launched in the US really slow down under the Trump regime, that's changed. Europe, it's, it's been massive. And the flows into ESG have been massive. And what's interesting about ESG is the portfolios have actually performed very well globally. Why? Because what are very positive ESG factors? Tech. So a lot of ESG funds have held a lot of tech and they've performed well and they've attracted flows and people feel good about their investments. So it's, it's kind of been this like tick, 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 really good. Areas that are non-ESG friendly, but looking very attractive, such as financials, energy, even resources a few years ago, you know, very un-ESG friendly, but, but actually looking attractive. So I think on a forward looking basis, ESG is um, gonna be, be it, it's gonna struggle to do kind of what it's done over the last few years. But more importantly, I think you're going to get a lot of managers, probably active managers, doing what green greenwashing. So, which is, you know, putting out a fund. Let's call it the, you know, the, the saving the world Earth Fund, and everyone's going to just trust that that fund is an ESG focused fund and give it money. And actually, when you dive down into the methodology, it's their own methodology, which perhaps is not so ESG focused. And and that's the big problem with ESG is that there's no one definition. There's no you know, we know what a value what value means broadly speaking. We know what growth means, but ESG is so subjective. Um, and if you look at the three kind of pillars that it falls into, the one of exclusionary, um, I don't want a tobacco company, I don't want mining. Uh, the other of um, you know, green investing, I want to invest in wind farms, I want to invest in solar. And and the third of um, I'm not going to place any judgment, but I'm going to within mining, I want to make sure that I want to know how Anglo stacks up next to Billiton. I want to know what they're doing for their community. I want to know what their governance procedures are. So you've got those three broad camps, but they're all painted with one brush ESG. And so I think going forward, investors are going to be lured by returns, which is what investors are always attracted to, but I maybe get comfort from the fact that it has an ESG label, but I think you're going to see a lot more greenwashing going forward, and you're going to need a lot more kind of clearly defined definitions of, of what stacks up as ESG or not. So when it comes to the passive side of that, just like I mentioned on the local side, unfortunately, it's going to require a bit more work. Like, okay, this is a passive ESG index. What does it hold? What does it define as ESG? You know, what a positive ESG rating? So uh, yeah, I guess a common theme of today is if you make the decision active or passive, do the homework, know what it is you're investing in, and, and be comfortable with the definitions of that index. So I think I think passive, ESG going forward, I think passive is going to be bigger than active. Well, certainly the one observation we've made is that um, the process of collecting and data and processing that data across all the different ESG inputs is, is a massive exercise. You know, all the carbon data, all, all of the other data that, that goes into the process. Um, and the firms that have actually been very well placed to do that data collection have been the firms that are good at data, which are the, actually the index firms. So you see big houses like S&P and MSCI and FTSE and, and, and I'm going to throw Morningstar into this as well. Um, the big research houses and index firms have actually been very well positioned to build out their research infrastructure and data collection processes in order to 
I suppose support passive managers and passive indexes on the one hand, but also to support ultimately, I guess, uh, active active managers um, uh, too. Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to to wrap up. I'm going to look to see if there are any last questions that uh, that we haven't answered. Um, I think most of them we've done justice to. Um, one second. Uh, Gareth, why are you, you looking think, for that? This is an interesting one, Vicky. So just yeah. to finish on the ESG. Will there be any brave managers who do uh, anti-ESG uh, uh, funds? So whilst clean energy is all the rage, uh, dirty energy might give you some good returns as everyone dumps their stocks and they remain cash generative. Um, interesting thesis there. Yeah, that is that is a, the irony I mentioned earlier. So from a Morning South perspective in our global portfolios, we... You know, we've had a, a global energy exposure from pretty much March last year, and it's been one of our highest conviction exposures. But then you know, the comment is, but your portfolio is not very green. And you know, we, we're not running ESG portfolios. We're running total return portfolios. But yeah. absolutely, I mean, that's, that's the conundrum for investors. I, they ultimately want total returns, but they want to feel good about what they're investing in. And yeah. that's a long-term game changing uh, companies. But yeah, you can't buy an energy company and, and, and say that it's, uh, it's, it's a green firm um but yeah <laughs> tricky one yeah, yeah. I, right. I think what um, I wanted to any... sorry Vicky sorry. sorry I just wanted to close on, on on the ESG but also on the indices I think it's important that investors realize one of the the big offerings that passive fund managers do and data companies is to provide broad entry points and so that is you know is to to use the data that you have and then to provide access and entry points to investors so the judgment side, whether they're good or bad, is, is not always the, the, the net goal. An active manager's goal is to say, I want to generate alpha above a benchmark. A passive manager is to say, here's a universe that is broadly representative of you know, X, Y, and Z. Here's an entry point. And I think those two different, they, they're very different um, offerings at an investment level. And that's why they're so complementary. agree with that. Great. Thanks, Vicky. Any, any other closing remarks? Before I no, I, I, no, I just uh, thank you to everybody who took the time to, to dial in today. I hope you found it um, informative. And, and Gareth, thank you to you and the core shares team for the opportunity to talk to your no, clients. Th thanks, Vicky. And I, you know, so often uh, when I engage with clients, um, the, the comment will be, but it's not about active and passive. It's about how one blends it and gets the best of both worlds. And we always agree with that. So it's nice to have someone come on and actually explain how, how one goes about that at, at, a, at a practical uh, level so so thanks once again Vicky uh, for for your time um, all right we're going to wrap up there thanks everyone um, just to to remind you all of the next the final of, um, webinar of this three webinar series which is taking place on the 14th of April you can still register on our website and the topic there is the changing role of the modern financial advisor and that's going to be led by my colleague uh, Michelle North um, and it's the tools and tips um, available to financial advisors within, within that context. So please go ahead and register. Um, and a reminder to please uh, fill in the last bit of detail in order to um, receive your CPD um, uh, points. But thanks again. I mean, obviously, please reach out to us if you've got any questions. I know there were a few comments on the chat around receiving the presentation. The recording will certainly be available. Uh, I will find a way to, to share the presentation as well, I'm sure. And um, so, so thank you once more. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.